Okay, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Esther Hyatt, and I'm pleased to have as many of you on as we see right now uh, today, September 16th. Um, we will be having performance art. These are short stories as written by the playwright um, J.E. Franklin. These short stories, she will introduce these short stories to you and then Mr. Coleman, you go next. So let us begin with uh, J.E. Franklin. Well, these two stories uh, were short plays originally and because of course we can't get into our theater space, I decided to translate them as performance pieces, as uh, uh, sometimes we call them monologues, sometimes we call them performance art, as a uh, one woman show for Miss Lonnie Burroughs. But the project began in 20, 000, uh, 2018 as a pilot project we, after we got a grant from the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone and the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council to design a, a project. Uh, called the Race Aid Project. We wanted to see how effective could the arts be in jump-starting a uh, dialogue on race that could take us beyond the rhetoric. So we designed this model called the Race Aid Project, in which the play is the thing at the center of the model. And we incorporated spoken word, music, uh, short biographical sketches. I mean, we performed this for an entire year in the Ruby D and Isa Davis Theater. And we would have gone further, of course, when the pandemic hit, we had to close down. So this is uh, the second component of the project. The first component was focusing on how race and the idea of race gets formed and, and its impact on the world. And the second component takes a look at the people who are impacted and how they respond to all of the forces that are generated by this thing called race and the race system. So today you're gonna to hear two, two, uh, two short stories uh, uh, compressed from the play. The first one is the day I rode the train with Jimmy to fetch Big Mama's mother. The second one is the day I overheard the grown-ups whispering about race. And then after Miss Burroughs performs the two stories, uh, we will have a dialogue with the members of the audience. I'll turn it over now to uh, Mr. Eric Coleman, who directed Miss Burroughs in these two plays, in these two stories. He's on mute. He's on mute. Yeah, he has to um, unmute. There you Am go. I, can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you, yes. And see okay. You. okay, well, this is very special indeed. It's been my pleasure over a number of years to have had the opportunity to have worked with Miss Viney Burroughs. I would say about 15 years or so in terms of our working association. But I have been observing and admiring this lady in her more than 6,000 performances over the years, for at least the last 40 years of her wonderful, wonderful work. And I know we are privileged to have her today with these two readings. Miss Viney Burroughs, recent winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award, Obie Award winner this June, still very much at it, doing it at a top level. Ms. Viney Burroughs. I was the one who found Big Mama dead. I didn't panic. I was surprised at how calmly I left the house and closed the screen door behind me. On my way home, I stopped by my Uncle Falvey's house to tell him. He had already left for work, so I headed home. When I broke the news to my mother, she struck me upside my head with such a blow, it loosened my plaits. After I picked myself up to the floor, 
I heard myself stuttering like my brother Jimmy. But, 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 but mom, Uncle Falvey wasn't home and I didn't know where else to have went. Mama said, fool, where you came in here talking? Don't you know that ain't no way to tell somebody they mama done died? Go find me my shoes. I didn't understand what I had said to make my mother turn on me so fiercely. As I searched for the shoes, the memory of what I said came back. Did I really use that dry, long, soaked tone? Well, mama, she gone now. Mother said, gone, who gone? Big mama, that's who. Gone where? I don't know where she gone. She might be gone to glory. Then again, she might be down to Hades. I went to the store to get her garret snuff, and when I got back, her eyes were open, so I say, Big Mama, here's your snuff. But she ain't answer me or take her snuff. So she did. She gone now. That's when her betraying fist came down on my head. Pow! Didn't you know I was the one who'd been on my knees at night praying for her deliverance from her mother? How could my feelings for the old snuff-dipping ogre have remained neutral the way she treated my mother? Each time she got summoned by her mother, she would return home, choked with tears, and move through the house as if she had lost her mind, directing her bitter rant at no one in particular, but always in my presence as if I had no ears. My mama looked a ways off, fuming, and said, I know my mama ain't never loved me. Salve and Mag and them, they can't do no wrong. But me, I bet not even fought crooked. Even better, on this block, everybody know my business because of her running her devilish mouth talking about she burned up my wedding clothes to keep me from marrying Benjamin because he was too old and couldn't read and write. That ain't why she did it. She just wanted me in to stay there under her and keep working and, and bringing her all my money so she could take care of everybody in that house. And to this day, and none of them never said, thank you, dog. Kiss my ass or nothing. And what was so killing about it, I was almost grown and still getting beaten. I didn't want me and Benjamin to have to run off like that. I wanted a real wedding like other girls, but she come she was silent now. My head still reeled from the blow. I walked behind her, beating back the wild weeds on our way to Big Mama's house. As soon as we entered, my mother took charge with a sureness I had never seen in her. Go so bring me that hand mirror, girl, and find some sheets to cover these mirrors up. She held a hand mirror before Big Mama's nose and seeing no mint mist on the pane, we set about covering every mirror in the house. 
go tell pastor to ring that church bell. The undertaker came, felt the body for signs of life, and then pressed the eyes closed. Well, right before he covered the body with a sheet, my mother placed a penny on each eyelid. I walked behind the undertakers as they rolled the body from the house and hoped the two pennies would fall. I was thinking I could buy a two cent pack of cookies in the lunch room at school to go with my lunch like the other children. But the pennies didn't fall. In the days that followed, as the neighbors came and went, one of them let slip something I'm sure my mother did not intend us to hear, that as a girl, she had once run away from home and had gone to her grandmother's house, which was some distance by train. Mama, I got another grandmother. What you know about her? She ain't your grandmother. She's my grandmother. Big Mama had a mother? Addie, ain't you got sense enough to know everybody had to have a mother? They wasn't hatched. So, Big Mama's mother was still alive. And there my mother was making plans to send my brother Jimmy to bring her back for the funeral. Jimmy was going to ride on a train and leave me. We ain't got the money to ship the body to her. Jimmy can go get her. He ain't 12 yet. He ride half price. From the back of the house in a stern, loud voice, my daddy waited. That boy ain't got sense enough to pour piss out of a boot. He like her to get on that train, get to farting around and gambling with a bunch of good for nothing. And who gonna be running after him? Addy Pearl got more sense than all these children put together. If you send him, send her too. Oh, she can come back and tell me if he was up there showing his ass. <laughs> My mother disliked the idea of sending me a girl of only eight, but her father had worked for the railroad and still had friends among the Pullman car porters. And when my father raised the plan to send me with Jimmy, my grandpa backed him up. Yeah. Send Addie with him. You can't send Jimmy by himself. Them paddy rollers see a colored boy on a train by himself. They think he up to no good. Pull him off that train and put him on one of them work gangs. You'll never see him again. Just like your boy Tom. Now, if he went with his little sister, they subject to let him alone. Now, I'll take both of them down to the train and put them in the hands of some of my Pullman buddies. They'll, they'll look after them till they get where they're going. Just like your boy, Tom. That's what turned my mother around. Ever since the day Tom disappeared and was never heard from again, the mention of his name would stop her in her tracks. There was no more resistance in letting me go on my first train ride. She filled a shoebox with food and grandpa's Pullman friend led us to the car where he could easily watch us. And I sat next to the window and was giddy with glee. Jimmy, look at them buffaloes, just like on the nickel. Ooh, ooh, look at all them cows. And there goes some sheeps, white sheeps, black sheeps, 
Baba black sheep, have you any wood? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Three bags full, one for the master, one for the king, and one for the little boy who lives in the... Oh, Jimmy, why are you joking me like that? Okay, okay, I'll shut up. We rode for hours until we reached the plantation where great-grandmother lived and a little plot of land deeded to her by her former master. Horseshoes were nailed over the door of a little unpainted shack that leaned groundward. Jimmy turned up his nose and said, shoot. I could huff and puff, puff and blow this little old pissy house down. I could push it over with just my little finger. Inside that house, the odor of Garrett's snuff met us. The whole place was a replica of Big Mama's house with its big crockery the cast iron skillets on a pot belly stove, its iron bed and its kerosene lamps with wicks turned low. My father was right about Jimmy. No sooner had his feet hit the plantation when he spotted a cluster of boys hovered around a game of, game of marbles. I saw the plan cross his face. He brought our luggage into the house, helped me break the news to our great-grandmother, and then off he went. At dusk, I had to go and look for him. I found him, his pockets jingling with money and bulging with marble. Oh, Daddy told me to tell him if you be up here gambling. But then he gave me one of the shiny dimes he had won, and my lips were sealed. <laughs> that night, Jimmy went through the house asking questions about everything. Oh, look, what these is, great grandma? Them's leg shackles. That's what they put on me. Or they put me on that ship and brought me across the water. Jimmy asked, you, you was on a ship, great grandmama? I ain't never been on no ship. I just been in a canoe with grandpa. If, if I was on that ship with you, I would have took them shackles off you. I don't reckon you could have did that, child. But one day, we all gonna sail on the mothership and find our way back home. Jimmy asked, so, so who is this great grandmama? This our mother? See, Jimmy had spotted a photo of a little girl sitting on great-grandmother's knee. And the girl looked like our mother, but great-grandmother said it was Big Mama. The only one of her four children had not been sold off. And now she was on her way to bury her. Oh, that's when I wish Big Mama hadn't died. On the train ride back, great-grandmother barely spoke a word. Jimmy didn't ask her any more questions. We both could see her heart was broke. This time, I barely looked at the buffaloes, the sheep, or the cows. And before we knew it, great-grandmother was shaking us awake. When we got home, Jimmy led her inside and seated her in the big rocking chair. 
Our mother heard our voices and hurried in from the back of the house. And when she saw her grandmother, she hesitated as if she did not recognize her. Then she suddenly lost all composure and threw herself at her grandmother's feet and buried her face in her lap and wept. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so loudly. Both Jimmy and I became frightened. I went to comfort her. Mama, don't cry. Please, don't cry, Mama. Even old Gandlin Jimmy came and knelt with us as if we were in prayer. And then I felt on my head the gentle laying on of hands of my big mama's mother. This is Viney Burroughs. And uh, if you're all set, Viney, you can move right into the day I heard the grown-ups whispering about race. When the constable came into the school to take Miss Austin away, we were all frantic with fear. She didn't go quietly. She was being led past the open door of each classroom. She shouted into us a defiant message for all to hear. Keep studying, children, study that one day, one day, you can stand with me and fight with me. Teachers tried to hold the children back and shield them from the scene, but they kept leapt from their seats and pressed past her until they were all in the hallway. An emergency assembly was announced over the PA system, and all classes were quickly and efficiently uttered into the auditorium, which fell tune quiet when the principal appeared. Children, as some of you know, Ms. Austin has been taken from us. There's no more, nothing came, nothing for us to worry at this point. However, Miss Austin will need our help. You'll each be given a note to take home to your parents on what they can do to have her released and returned to us. In the meantime, how many of you in here have family members or other grown-ups who've talked to you about race? Of all the eager hands that shut up, shut up, none were, I was the only one to be recognized. My big brother told me about race. He said the best race was the 20, the 220, the 440, the 880, and the 100 yard dash. <laughs> From the back of the auditorium where children in the upper grades sat came a deafening laughter. I didn't understand what the laughter was all about. The only races I understood was the ones I had run with my big brothers on the road that stretched past our house all the way from the corner of Market and Schweitkart. In an uninterrupted half mile stretch without intersections until it reached the railroad tracks. And on those glorious nights when there was no traffic and my parents let us turn the road into a play street filled with roller skates, scooters, and hand foot races, I could move with my brothers, race with my brothers, 
who always let me win on the warm, smooth, black top street lit only by the moon and the stars, my dress tail flying against the wind like a kite, and me racing barefoot as I inhale the aroma of watermelons and the odor of mosquito smokes and wiener roast taking place in neighbors' yards, all to the sound of happy crickets. The principal finally restored order. And then he did his best to help us wrap our young minds around the mystery of the race crime our teacher had been charged with. You all know that Miss Austin is colored, like all of us here in this school. And the many of us who are members of this colored community, some of us have a color that's white, but we have been assigned to the colored race, while others who have a color that's white have been assigned to the white race. Now the law states that members of the white race and members of the colored race must be separated from each other. Everything we do and have, even the books we touch and read must be separate. And by law, we must remain within those assignments. Now, when Miss Austin borrowed books from the library and returned them after they'd been touched by some of you, the law says she violated the race laws. Now, many people have been working with Miss Austin to change those laws. So that was why, well, that was why we could not go to the library in free, as free and equal citizens of the city, of the state, and of this country. The more the principal tried to explain, the more confusing things became. So we hurried home with the notes we'd been given and saw the children were already going door to door to collect money for our teacher. And when I entered the house, my mother was keeping company with her neighbor's friends and she took the note as if she'd been expecting it. Oh, look at here. Look here. Mm. Look what I had done to brought into this house. I ain't no use in your, your asking me, can you go nowhere, Addie? Because you ain't going. I don't want to hear nothing about what other children's mama letting them do or letting them go. This mama ain't got no children in my house. Now, your daddy just got home from work and say all of them on the job was questioning him because they know you go to that school. Now he don't want you mixed up in this mess. Did you have your hands on them books, Addie? You better not let your daddy find out you had your hands on them dead, devilish books. That teacher's gonna have to pay for every book you all touch. Now you see why I told you to keep your hands off other people's things. You ain't got no, no money to be paying for no books. You can all, oh, oh, you can cry all you want to. You better dry up or I give you something to cry for. Now get your tail in that room and get out of them good clothes and go on out and play. I thought my heart would break. Miss Austin had never let us touch the book. For fear we'd have peanut butter and jelly 
jelly little mayonnaise on our fingers. She would read the books aloud to us, carefully turning the pages herself to show us the pictures. We would jostle and shove each other to get as close as we could to the books, though many of the words were too hard for us. The next day, the headlines of the white newspapers read, Impasse passes for white at town library. And the colored newspapers read, Colored teacher arrested for using library. Now the colored newspapers call Miss Austin brave and courageous. And the white newspapers called her a wolf in sheep's clothing. Invisible Negro, Leopard Without Spots, com Communist, and Troublemaker. We children felt we were to blame for Miss Austin's arrest. It was on our account that she had borrowed the books for our school library did not have the ones she wanted us to read. She would drive across town, bring the books to school, read them to us, and return them when the last page had been read. Oh, we loved her for it. One day, someone followed her from the library into the colored ward where she lived, and her true identity was reported. The charges were, quote, impersonating a white person with full knowledge that nigger blood was running, running through her veins, end quote. Quote, impersonating a white person during the commission of a crime, end quote. Quote, contaminating and defiling white property, end quote. Quote, endangering the health and welfare of untold numbers of white people through the contamination and defilement of their property, the books. Miss Austin's defense was that she had never claimed to be white, that the librarian had not asked her her racial identity or for proof of her racial condition, and that furthermore, the librarian had made up her own assumptions and had willingly allowed her to check out the books. The books had all been returned undamaged, but the charges stood. In addition to her bail, before she could be released, she was ordered to pay for every book she had checked out. I changed from my school clothes, but I refused to go outside to play. Instead, I hid under the bed, my ears hungry to understand what kind of race, which was not a running race. One of the neighbors said she belonged to the NAACP, so they tell me. You reckon they sent her to do one of them test cases? Well, I thought that might be the case. Well, them white folks just do double head when it comes to this race mess. Now, we all be in their home, cooking their food, touching everything they got in there. Listen, y'all, I work for this lady that got me doing the laundry. One day, her husband walks in and seen me folding his drawers. He just stand there giving me that surprise look like, what you doing folding my drawers? It must have just dawned on him that I'm the one been washing his dirty drawers all this time. Now what the hell do you think he had been doing? His lazy ass wife? Lo and behold. The next thing I know, he done vamped on me, all smoochy, trying to guide my hand down to his, whoops, 
What you doing? Is, what you doing doing that? Catherine, she's still in the room. When I heard my mother feet coming towards the door, I froze, afraid to even breathe. No, I bet she not. She better not be in there. I done told her about hanging around under me, trying to listen to grown up folks' business. You at it, you? Well, I don't see her. I reckon she went outside, <laughs> like I told her. Ain't Miss Austin daddy white? How come he don't get her out of this mess? Oh, but I reckon he don't claim her, just like the rest of these white men around here that's preaching against this uh, miscegenation, or whatever they call it, trying to brainwash the white woman's ass, I suppose. <laughs> Mighty funny. They ain't brainwashed their own ass. They still having coitus with colored women. This white man sure lucky he ain't put his hands on my dark mother and sighed me, because I would tell everybody what he'd done and who he'd done it with. <laughs> oh, you and me both, sugar. Well, I'll go get me one of them bullhorns. Wonder how they fixes it in their mind to be with colored women, but get all spooked when one of us touch their books. I hear tell they done burned the books and they still making the lady pay for them. Ain't that a dirty low down, dirty low down shame. Well, Miss Austin ain't got but a drop of colored blood in her. And even that little drop must have dropped down to her feet somewhere, cause can't nobody else ever see it. She got that fly hair and them blue green eyes. I don't know what they think her, her one little drop gonna do to them. I reckon they scared it's gonna stop them from being white, being colored or something. Well, it's a damn sure shame. It did turn her color now, didn't it? Girl, you ain't never lied. Boisterous laughter exploded in the room and the women continued to joke and laugh about the matter until the visit ended. I didn't understand what the laughter was all about. That night, it was hard for me to sleep. The scene kept replaying itself in my dreams of the constable leading Miss Austin through the long hallway, her hands cuffed and her words of defiance. Keep on studying, children. Study so one day you can fight with me. I didn't know if I was awoke or dreaming, but suddenly there she was, standing at the foot of my bed. Miss Austin, I know why the constable took you away, because what you got inside you is so strong and so powerful, just one little drop of it can stop a white body from being white. It can turn a white person colored. And then, to let me know I had it correct, she gave the special sign. The one she always gave us in class whenever we go to the blackboard and get our arithmetic or our grammar correct. She would wink at us. That night, she winked at me. Fight with me, Addie. Stand with me, fight with me, and we'll all be free. Yes, ma'am, Miss Austin, I will. I promise, I will. My mama stuck her head inside the room. Girl, what's wrong with you? Who are you in here talking to? Get on up and get yourself ready for school and get out of here. That morning, I ran all the way to school and was the First one there, the schoolyard slowly filled with other children who looked for Miss Austin's car. When, when she had not arrived by the ringing of the bell for, for us to go inside, we knew she would not come that day. Each day, I would hurry to the school and wait at the edge of the school 
to be the first to run to and ask and yell, I saw her first! But she didn't come. Still, I waited. Each school day, I waited until I was no longer a pupil at the Atherton Colored Elementary School. Thank you so much. Woo! That's it. Mm. That's a border. Those are that was fabulous. Wow. Fabulous. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful story, isn't it? Yes. And you told it so beautifully for us. Thank you yeah. so much. Now, J.E., you have some questions for us? Uh, yeah, I, I, I thought that uh, Dr. Hyde was going to give them to different um, people in the audience. As you can see, both of these stories are the memory pieces. And uh, they're supposed to be told by an adult that's looking back uh, on those first teachable moments when uh, the, the child first heard these things about race and and uh, and learn that that uh it was something other than a foot race that it was um a crime thing that for many people it, race was a was about committing a crime and being a crime um first question that, I, that for the first story entitled the day i rode the train with jim at the fed to big mama's mother you notice that um, the, the parents understand the danger that's awaiting their son. They, they know what danger uh, can, can uh, come to black boys, especially if they're traveling alone. Uh, and so they have to devise a protective strategy, save their, their boy child. So what strategies did they devise in that, in that story, if you can recall? The, the strategy that uh, that they came up with to protect this black boy riding on the train to get get his his great grandmother. Well, how, that's how, why they had the little girl with him, right? And yeah, how, that, right, protection. Mm. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we don't even have to go back, uh, Je, to uh, your forebears. Here in New York City, when I was a child, uh, I have a sister, and my mother would often ask that uh, the two of us go places together, uh, my sister being a, a sort of a blanket of, of, of coverage. Right here in New York, not all that many years ago. Right. That's that, actually, that was a question that I wanted to ask, like what strategies do parents Oh, that's to Kathleen. Play? Oh, my friend Kathleen, I didn't recognize her. Dialogue network for dialogue. Yes. So really, the danger hasn't lifted, and this you know we we still use the same strategies today. Very very true. Now you notice that Jimmy's father, uh, you know, he say things like he can't pull piss out of a boot, and he, he didn't have very much confidence in him, and he doesn't see him as being too bright. But you know, probably because of the stutter, but probably because of something else too. And, but, but ironically, when Jimmy, when the two children arrive at their great grandmother's house, it's Jimmy that, that uh, is, is a kind of a, a scholar in, in, in terms of asking all the, the questions. He's asking questions about the, uh, the shackle, the pair of shackles that he sees in the house. Uh, he's asking about this ship that his great grandmother says she was on. Uh, he, he's the one who's really probing and uh, so, you know, we, um, we, we, we see a change in him. So that they are certain, although the word slave is never used, I mean, the great grandmother never says she's a, she's a slave, or she was a, a, a slave, or, or even say that she was enslaved, there are certain cold words that she used. So do you remember some of these cold words that, that she used to, uh, to make Jimmy and you know to help Jimmy and his sister understand. Oh, you're still here. Mm -hmm. well, we talked about going back home, going back that the ship would take them back. 
Right. Yeah, that was that was touching to me. I think she still had the hopes that she would get to go back home. Okay. Home was not where she was living, but home was where her country was. Yeah, where she had been uprooted mm -hmm. from. Uh huh. And she held on to the shackles as something mm -hmm. as a reminder for her own captivity and her freeing. So Jimmy could see that she was freed from those shackles, <clears throat> but always kept them as a reminder of the kind of forces he would have to battle and understand mm. and cope with mm. going forward in his life. Right. May I say something? Please. Well, that was an excellent story. And, and I'm, I'm sad to know that I'm just hearing about this lady. She told the story real, real well. I used to listen at them stories as a young man from a 98-year-old lady when I was like five, six, and seven years old in Mobile, Alabama, because her ancestors, which was my people, came over on the last enslaved African ship to Mobile, Alabama, called the slave ship Clotilda. Mm -hmm. But the fertilizer that they was using then to grow us into consciousness and... Uh, I think we got to remix that because right now I heard her say something that was very familiar with me. When they send you out, they put a female, which in you was almost, that was a guaranteed safety. But right now with our little young daughters is being shot and they're rewarding people with that. I think we got to go back to the drawing boards, remix that fertilizer and grow it. And we wait too late sometimes to tell our children about race and, uh, and, and, and the harm that, when, if you break down on the side of the road, you might end up being a dead man. So I like that, but I just think that we got to go back to, to the drawing board and we got to stop being so forgiven as well. And uh, I love it, and, and, and I'm just glad that I was invited. Thank you. I saw something the other day that was quite frightening, and I, I haven't been able to verify its truth. But I saw a picture of a woman taking a tracking device out of a bra strap, a preteen bra strap that she said is being used by the sex traffickers to track young girls and to find them and to kidnap them and take them away. Now, when she pulled it out, I thought, okay, well, maybe it was just something that the stores use, you know, like to, to make sure you don't walk past any barriers when, if you're trying to shoplift. But mm -hmm. it was, it had um, like computer code on it. It just looked too sophisticated to just be one of those like blocks that you, you see that they take off of your clothes. You know, if you, you go to the cashier and then they have to take off those, those big chunks of whatever it is mm -hmm. by a special machine. So mm -hmm. I agree. I think we have to be very vigilant. I think we have to be very aware. I think that we still have to be very careful about how we send our children out and where we're sending them to and knowing where they are. And I mean, clearly, I know I'm not of that particular generation. I'm an older generation, but I remember as a child, when we moved up to the Bronx when I was about five years old, my, there was a school that was behind our house that my mother had clear vision of if I was to walk to that school. And she was hoping that I got into that school. But that school, because of the one street that we were crossed over from, was not my, my school designated area. So I had to go to the other school where I either had to be walked to school, find my own way or whatever. And I remember, even as I got older, my parents would follow me. I never went, I never went to school without someone being with me. And as I got older, it was either, I mean, it was like kindergarten to the sixth grade at this particular school. And then when I got into junior high school, I, I did go to the, the other school where my parents could see that I could walk to school. But I, I, when I think back on it, I remember having this feeling that I was never alone, that I, will, that I was always being watched over. And I would look up sometimes and I'd see my mother standing in the, the classroom door or um, going around the corner and seeing my grandmother there, just always somebody available, you know? Mm -hmm. So I do think we do have to be vigilant and we have to be very careful. Absolutely, yeah. And someone got to also be available now. One of the problems is, especially as an African here in America, whether it's male or female, we don't have anybody available. So that's why I say we got to go back to the drawing board and not only 
for our sake to make sure that we have people available and watching over us, willing to protect us, willing to give their life if they have to, like your grandmother them. Uh, I think that, that we have to make sure we implant that, and especially a lot of these young people, and especially on this West Coast, because we have so much, many mentally dead people that it's just going to take people like us to uh, kind of redo that mindset. Right. Absolutely. We need people like J.E. to keep writing these stories. She, I've been working with her for close to 30 years. And one thing about any play of J.E.'s, she reaches back into her own past. And she's honest about the people she knew and grew up with. And she values their experience. Uh, she never condescends to it or in any way dismisses it. And that's why I think it resonates so well with us today. Because it is so true. And if we open our eyes, we see things have not changed that much. Exactly. She, the most important thing I hear about this young lady, I'm going to say this lady, and I love that I remember those stories. And I remember going and talking to what we call at the time the hobos down by the train track, which a lot of them, they call them homeless people. And they gave up a lot of knowledge. And she brings this story to life. And I think that's what we got to do with our young people. We have to have people like her when we hit these stages all over the country, maybe all over the world, to bring this back to life because not only will we connect with some of the mentally dead young people and people of another generation, but those people that don't look like us, I heard them eavesdropping and I saw them like listening to these stories and it put a, another kind of spirit in them. I love the way she bring it to life and I want to be the one, if I can, to contribute to help promote these things so the world will know that this lady exists because I don't want her to leave here and somebody else have that legacy and be telling that story. I'd be very disappointed. Oh, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> now in the second story, uh, the day I overheard, overheard the grown-ups whispering about race, one of the characters uh, was, you know, kind of musing on, I wonder, wonder how these white folks fix it in their mind. They're having quarters with colored women, and then they get all spooked up when we touch their books. So do, do you have a theory to explain how white people fix it in their minds to justify the, this contradiction? Are you talking to me? Yeah, fix our what? food and, what? you know, wash their drawers and be all in their house, you know, but we, they don't want us touching their books. And how, and how, do, how do they, how do you think they fix it and, and uh, justify it in their mind? Well, it comes, comes down to who's going to tell the story, the lion or the man. They never <laughs> wanted us to feel equal. They know we were the most brilliant humans around when you go back in history and stuff, but they still never want you to feel equal. That's why they want to take the mindset. That's why they had a lot of people in fear of telling their children or explaining their sons and their daughters that it was, it's very dangerous out here. But guess what? It's more dangerous right now, I think, just as dangerous now than it was then because nobody, I'm not going to say anybody, but we're not implanting that in these people ahead. We feel like if we get a $12 million suit and it's okay, but it's not okay. Those people have not been arrested. You'll arrest me on hearsay. And I think that we have to separate ourselves because everybody look like us, don't think like us. I'm looking at the television and all these people apologizing about the sheriff that got shot. We always have taken care of people. Big mama, uh, uh, they, she concarded that stuff that she got out of the, uh, the woods and made medicine and saved these people life. But every mm -hmm. time we see something happen, everybody wants, we got to stop being so apologetic. You know, we're, 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 we're sensible people, but they don't want us to feel equal, but we taught them civilization. So we have to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Brother Leroy. In terms of, uh, first of all, uh, Sister Vinnie Burroughs, fantastic. Her portrayal, reminded me of reading J. California Cooper's books. Mm. Yes, where is she? Is she still uh, she, around California Cooper? No, she, <laughs> she made a transition a few years ago. Mm. But um, we were able to interview her maybe two or three times. Mm. But um, in the writing, the writing, you see, I'm, I'm sitting listening 
to the library story and it's it's not believable. Now, here's what I'm saying. It's not believable to me who reads black history. So mm. what what has to happen with that play and, and maybe in the first one, I just can't remember all the pieces in the first one, is that, in my opinion, it should have an introduction that what you, this is Leroy talking, what, you, what you're about to hear is true, is based on true events, but dramatized, something like that, if, if you understand where I'm going. So you prepare that audience, especially the young people in the audience, they hear, they, they, they can't comprehend. I said, I, it's unbelievable to me. The children, the young people can't comprehend the fact that someone would be put in jail for for touching, for being black and touching a book. Your question, mm. your question as to why is based in the root of our enslavement here in America. That is to make us beasts of the field. The only way they could do it is block out the light in the mind so that that's exactly. carried through until today. Our children are not succeeding in school, but the trick is to make us think that they are dumb, that our own children hmm. are dumb. Why didn't you do your homework? You can't do the homework because you can't even understand the homework. And then when the parent, <laughs> the parent approaches the book, because they have some basic math, they don't understand what this stuff is about. <laughs> and so, so the, the question is answered by studying the root the root of what they have done and still do, but it's covered over with technology today. But it's, uh, these, these two pieces are very, very good. Um, uh, you, you, if I'm correct, the one of the mothers, big mother, whatever, she uses her daughter's money to, um, how, how did you have it? Uh, to finance giving giving food financing uh, uh, the giving of food or parties for other people I think that's that and that that's true that is happening I'm not going to say it's happening today you point out something that that we have to deal with that mindset of some mothers of using their daughters for money coming into the home. But I enjoyed I enjoyed both uh, tremendous writing, tremendous presentation by the sister sister Burroughs and and uh, this whole presentation I had no idea of how it would be. I'm saying, well, how are they going to do this thing? I see hmm. a whole group of possibilities coming out of what what you have done today. It's fantastic. Uh, Absolutely. Enjoy for that. Okay. May, I, may, I, may I jump in quickly? I'm terribly, sorry. I'm terribly sorry, but I must leave. But I wanted to say, and I actually uh, wrote this in the chat because I thought you guys would check the chats, but I guess you, you're not checking the chat. Uh, but I wanted to thank um, Bonnie Burroughs for a wonderful reason. I also wanted to thank Jay Franklin for inviting me. Terribly sorry that I must leave, but I need to leave and prepare for a class and so forth. Okay, I just wanted to say that quickly before I zoom out. Okay? Give us a quick, quick mention in the, the Times. If you can. <laughs> okay. Thank you. If it ever comes to that, I certainly would do that. Okay. Thank you. And I really enjoyed this. Appreciate you. All right, Nathaniel. Okay. Bye bye. Before you guys get you know, uh, off, are you guys familiar with this book? I think it's Kindred, uh, Octavia Button. We know Kendrick. I am. I'm familiar with it. Powerful book. Well, they, they got, they got 850,000 copies talking about some, this is more or less fiction, uh, but it's true stories, just like the sister just told, you know, they are uh, very interesting that I was invited to this just last night. And here, this thing is coming back into reality right now. This is about to be a movie, probably be a sellout, but I would like to see those stories that the sister just told. I would like to, like I said, to contribute 
to really bring this to life. I consider myself a 21st century change agent, not an activist, because most people talk about activists. I want to know what have you activated in the last six months, a positive change that made a real difference The people that look like me. It's okay to talk about me and people look like me because we're in the worst condition there is. People pull up in Rolls Royces, but their mindset is really terrible. So I'm just so glad to be, just to hear this and be involved, and I want to be a part of that change. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, I think we have to discuss timing now. We have to leave. Uh, I want to thank Stu Reed. Uh, um, uh, he's the engineer of our podcast. Thank you, has, Stuart. Many, well, many welcome. Uh, it was my, my treat, and thank you, Miss Burroughs. Yeah. What an incredible reading. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope send me thank the dub. you, uh, Stu, for p coming in. He has a radio show this evening, and um, you know I don't even want to talk to Stu on Wednesdays because I know how busy he is. But he he was able to fill in for um, Brother Doug, and uh, that that it, it just worked out nice. And thank you again, Stu. Stu, uh, safe and. What is the name of the radio? Oh, safe and Smart. S-A-F-E, letter N, smart, dot O-R-G. You can go there and review uh, so many of the programs that we do. Brother Leroy has a series, uh, Community and Technology is a series I do on uh, WHCR radio. Uh, Brother Leroy does his Wisdom Table and many other programming that we do, uh, community-based programming you can see at safeandsmart.org. Mm -hmm. Safeandsmart.org. Uh -huh. Okay. I and, got it. Okay, and tap into community. Community and technology, and check out the wisdom table. Brother Leroy has okay. an entire library that he's been doing for the last several years. Incredible. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, God bless you, Viney. Yes, yes. God bless <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Run, and I think you did it justice. Mm -hmm. I'm very much encouraged. Yeah. For further. Miss, Miss Austin at the end gives us a challenge. You know, continues to fight. Uh, Austin says she tells the children, she says it's the study. Stand right. with me. I think okay. we don't work from Judy here. Uh, I just wanted to say, I think that Zooming this worked amazingly well. And I think that uh, going forward, as long as we have the stupid pandemic, uh, that this is a way to exploit and uh, to get more people on it. And uh, I think it works very well. I, 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 it was just, I just felt so up close and personal with um, having the screen just filled with your face, Ms. Burroughs. It was, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful reading and uh, the stories were terrific. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I just like to say, Esther, for the folks here, if they want to replicate and do more of these things, please get in touch with Esther. I'm available and I'm accessible and we can do this, no problem. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, thank you, J.E. Yes, yes. And remember, we call. Oh, let me know if you want to uh, access this on you YouTube, right, Stu? Yes, I'm going to send a link to Sister Esther where okay. this video is going to be posted on YouTube, and also I know Ms. Burroughs had asked for an audio. I'm going to send yes. an audio as well, audio only. That's wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Is Kathleen here? I see her picture, Kathleen Cannon. Yes, she's on. Yes, I'm, I'm here and I came in late and I was very happy to be here and just very happy to be here and to listen. But I would like to remain part of the group if it continues uh -huh. on in any way. But I think J.E. has email. That's how I think I heard from her. Okay. J.E. So keep me posted, please. And Viney, you were wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Malika, Malika. Okay, bye bye. Thank you, Stu. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Go. All right, signing off. Godspeed. Godspeed to all of you. Okay, thank you very much. Godspeed on the mothership.